I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes uh, to share with you personal experience past 10 years with GSAP. Um, so uh, I have a little story to tell later. But let's look at energy storage. This becomes very clear, but 10 years ago, it wasn't so. So we look at this, you say, well, every year we, we uh, sell about uh, you know, a billion uh, uh, smartphones. Each one of you carry one. Um, and electric car is uh, coming in in a big wave, and uh, California require renewable storage. Um, just going from here to the car, roughly you need to double the annual production of lithium ion. And then going from the electric car to the grid, you need multiple times. So this is a huge demand right there. Then you say, I ask the question, everybody asks, you know, what kind of batteries do we exactly need uh, to meet with those demands? Let's use lithium ion as the, uh, the benchmark. Um, for portable electronics, there's no question, it has to be lithium ion. For transportation, also, it looks like it needs to be lithium ion because of uh, high energy uh, density needed. So this is cell level and system level. Let's look at both. Um, cell level, we have roughly around 200 or so watt per kilo. For the long term, we really like to get, get to 600 three times. But if we can double, that's already very, very good. But for academia research, we like to see whether three times is possible. System level, you cut by half. That's the, the number you are getting. So this is referred to the pouch cell. When you go to 18650 cell, the cylinder cell, what Tesla is using. So this number will be higher. This will be 250. Then you will say, I want to multiply three times. That's 750. This is kind of cell level cost. We are somewhere around 150 to $200 per kilowatt hour. System level, somewhere between $300 to $500 per kilowatt hour, roughly this range. So we would like to get to system level 150, cell level probably 70 or so. Uh, these two are really critical, these two, for the transportation. For the grid scale storage, of course, energy density will not matter that much because the footprint can be bigger. However, it will matter, it will affect the cost eventually. You, Cycle life, you know, different people have different number right here. This calculation is based on you charge your car once per day. You want it to be 10 years, you need 3,000 cycle. For the grid, you need a lot more. You need 30 years, perhaps. However, I have to say this number can be deceiving. If you have a car like Tesla, it runs 300 miles per charge. You only need 500 cycles. 500 times 300 gives you 150,000 miles. That's plenty. So depending on your range, how big your pack is, this number will change. Safety, this become more and more important. So Samsung's No7 uh, accident certainly uh, really brought everything into consideration again. Can we really make our batteries very safe, uh, fundamentally safe? That's a key question as well. So, Let's look at the grand challenge of the batteries right there, giving those numbers. These are some of the questions we ask. Do we have the batteries chemistry to give us 3x of energy density compared to the current technology? How do we do that? Can we get the cost 3x lower? Can we make it safe? If this happens, these this great things will also come. So past 10 years, Stanford right here after joining faculty, so we opened up a, a bunch of, a number of research programs try to address those challenges. Um, I will pick some examples based on the GSAP's research. If you look at the, this whole, uh, these three um, uh, grand challenges right there, one major thing is actually the energy density, increase the range. If the manufacturing cost per battery is the same, you also reduce the cost of the batteries per kilowatt hour. That's a really a, a key thing to do. So graphite is known, is a material for 25 years now, used as an anode to intercalate lithium to store lithium. We have new materials such as silicon and lithium metal can do 10 times higher capacity. So if you, you could use that, your energy density will go very high. 
cathode side, this is other lithium metal oxide, no matter, uh, it doesn't matter, it's a lithium cobalt oxide or lithium manganese oxide or lithium ion phosphate. The family of, the, of these uh, three different materials roughly get to somewhere close to uh, 150 to 200 million mile per gram. You also have a choice of sulfur become lithium sulfide. That gives you also 10 times. So if you can make this happen, this is a theoretical energy based on graphite, silicon, and lithium metal. You have a chemistry available to do three times. You even have chemistry available to do six times. So if you can make this practically working, then you are getting somewhere. So let me use silicon as an example. So silicon, I show you, has 10 times capacity. Silicon's problem will also uh, very similar to other battery materials problem. Silicon can take a lot of lithium coming in, 10 times higher capacity. However, volume expansion is four times, you are facing two big problems. Number one is breaking. Number two is uh, how do you build a stable interface of silicon uh, you know, facing the liquid, organic liquid electrolyte. So this is the first pro of GZ project. I believe this is the batch of project GZ ever funded on the batteries. So I joined the faculty in 2005, uh, starting uh, roughly January 2007. <coughs> this project coming in, uh, I give a brief title, it's a nanowire batteries uh, with me as PI and Fritz Prince as co-PI. I'll come back to the, uh, the story later. So over the years, <coughs> So we developed the tool to really understand how the battery charging work. This is an situ holder now available at Stanford University. Uh, have a lithium cobalt oxide cathode. You can put your anode right there, insert into this ion the liquid, and then you use electron beam to watch what's happening. You can deposit particles and see what happened to particles as well. So I want to show you a video. This is video of silicon nanowires during charging. The volume expands a lot. This is 200 nanometer scale bar. So it starts from 200 and expands a lot, but it doesn't break. And the surface has a copper coating. The copper is broken. So this is really powerful process. This really gives the idea how silicon can break the batteries. Now let me show you another video. This is a video with a nano wire and then a number of silicon particles right there. Some are small. This is one really big one. This is 800 nanometer in diameter. Once lithium coming in, volume expands a lot. Increasing um, silicon interface shrinking create amorphous lithium silicon phase. Eventually, the stress is too big. This particle cannot hold it, and it's going to be broken. But the small one is stable. So once this is broken, you lose the material, you lose electrical contact, the batteries die. The first time you charge your battery, you find out it's already close to be dead. Uh, that's the challenging uh, back then. So using uh, nanomaterials engineering, we, f we found a way to make this to work, prevent the breaking. So that's this whole thing coming in. We have a generation uh, uh, one design uh, that's nanowires. Diameter small enough, they don't break. Then that's not enough. We want it to be more stable. We have core shell design and then hollow design. After a couple of years, it seems like breaking problem is solved. But remember, we have a number two problem. What about the interface? If uh, something keeps expanding during lithium coming in and contract when lithium goes out during this charge, you don't have a stable interface. So our generation four, I consider as another big milestone after generation one is engineer a double, double wall hollow structure. The interior is hollow. This blue color is silicon. Outer layer, the red color is a mechanically strong coating. Once lithium coming in, charge up your batteries. And the volume expansion happening by expand towards outside, inside, not towards outside. Outside has the organic electrolyte. So you build a stable surface. So we address this interfacial stability issue. So indeed, after this paper, there's a really numerous study in the literature mimicking our idea, now can make all type of materials to work, not only silicon, germanium, tin, many others, you can name it. Uh, it's try to create a stable interface. 
We have been through 11 generations now. Let me highlight uh, just two. Another generation is, even it doesn't break, you have stable interface. However, nanostructure will have too high surface area to react with organic electrolyte. Consume lithium, consume electrolyte, that's not good. So we took on this challenge to design a new generation. We, we call this as a pomegranate-like structure. Basically packing this nanoparticle into secondary structure and coat it outside with uh, uh, another uh, materials so prevent the electrolyte to come and effectively reduce the surface area and make it stable. So it's getting much better. And also along the way, this is another later uh, uh, recent years uh, a project just finished supported by GSET is what if you do have the breaking? Can you come up with an idea and let the breaking self heal? So together with Professor Janan Bao, we use self-healing polymer. Self-healing polymer has this functionality. It has this chemical uh, uh, you know, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is very easy to broken. However, this polymer chain can move around and find each other and reform the hydrogen bonding. Eventually, self-heal the whole electrode. So uh, this self-healing can be better seen. Coating it is self-healing polymer on top of a balloon and uh, make it visible, we put in conducting carbon black. You can measure its conductivity. You blow out this balloon many times by still conducting the surface. Uh, and then you string it back, the conductivity nearly recover. Showing you this uh, self-healing polymer is uh, very uh, strong. It actually can make a micron particles to work. The micron silicon particle, they, they will be broken. They're different from nanoparticles. However, now using self-healing polymer, you can start to cycle this. So now let me come to the next thing. For high energy materials, such as silicon, after uh, roughly 10 years of research, we understand the material design principle. What about safety? The more energy you put into the battery, if there's something bad happens, you're going to have more, en more energy to burn your batteries. So can we design something that really prevent the bad things happen. We have been thinking about this for a couple of years now. Uh, let me share with you uh, two, uh, two ideas. So you have seen all kinds of accidents. I haven't had a chance to put in the Samsung uh, uh, cell phone yet, but everybody knows about that. So let's see if you have a batteries with cathode anode. So what happened very likely is either due to internal reason or external reason, you have some sort of shorting. Once you have shorting happening, well, let me mention this reason. The external reason can be accidents. You know, outside, is, uh, you, know, you bump into your batteries. Inside can be you have manufacturing defect, you have overcharge, or you charge it in the cold weather. Once you have shorting, next thing happens is very fast release of uh, electricity through this shot. And it's going to heat up the batteries to roughly about 100 degrees C. Starting at this temperature, you are going to have exothermic reaction of solid electrolyte interface, the interfacial coating. During uh, the battery charging, you, know, you have decomposition of the electrolyte. This release heat, once it goes roughly above 180 degrees C, something really bad happening. The metal oxide on the cathode will react with organic electrolyte. This will just automatically go, called thermal runaway. At this moment, the battery was, you cannot control. It will start to uh, catch fire very quickly and, uh, or, or even uh, cause explosion. So in order to make your battery safe, internally, you don't want your battery to short. Can you really detect the shorting? You know, you have manufacturing defect. You might have overcharge. So we come on an idea in the battery separator right here. This is cathode, this is anode. We embed it over porous, very thin, roughly 50 to 100 nanometer metallic coating. Once the shorting happens halfway, for example, dendrite formation, you measure the potential of this intermediate layer versus your anode, you can see the voltage drop to zero. At this moment, you know your battery is in danger. You need to stop charging. So at, you, you are still safe, you still have halfway to go. So your laptop, if it's your laptop, it just tells you shut down your batteries within a minute. If you don't do that, it will just automatically do it for you so, uh, to make it safe. So we actually show this idea work. Now the question is, what about external accident? You don't have a control. 
you know, your car bomb into something and then, then do something, you know, really penetrate into your batteries. So what we want to control right here is prevent very fast release of the electricity through the shot. So together with Professor Junan Bao, uh, we come on the idea is on the metallic foil, this current collector, we coat it with very thin layer of polymer. This polymer inside embedded with these nickel nano spikes. At the room temperature, they are connected electronically. They are conducting as a metal. But once this temperature heat up due to shorting, and this polymer thermally expands, and once the expansion happens, it's going to pull this metallic nanoparticle open, and electrons cannot move between these particles anymore. So the reason we need these nano spikes is when this, this spike touch with each other, electron can go through through tunneling, you know, very uh, close distance. Once you pull this open by an angstrom or two, the tunneling uh, current scale with the uh, exponentially with the uh, distance, one over distance. So uh, and your current will go very small. So you can have very very uh, sensitive switching uh, phenomenon. So we take these nano spikes of nickel coated uh, uh, with uh, graphene. Graphene is to make uh, nickel stable chemically. And uh, you uh, embed it into polyethylene or polypropylene. It's in the polymer, very low cost. Uh, and now you test out the resistance versus the, uh, the, uh, uh, the temperature. Let's look at this uh, green curve right here with about 30% of a nano uh, spike of nickel in there. You heat up this uh, uh, polymer film. You see at the beginning is uh, metallic conduction. At about 90, 95 degrees C, this uh, sharp transition become a complete insulator. The resistance change is A orders magnitude, become a complete insulator. Now, the battery material coated onto this polymer, there's no way it can transfer electron very fast to the your metallic foil current collector. So you prevent a very fast release of the energy due to shorting. Even you do have a shot, but it's not shorting through your metallic current collector. Your current density is reduced significantly, significantly so you don't heat up your batteries. So I want to show you this is the battery we built and the room temperature. You can see you can get the regular capacity out we engineer this uh, a film, uh, uh, this uh, polymer film, and 70 degrees C start to respond, and it becomes the uh, this, this battery become basically dead. There's no capacity coming out. But once it come back to the room temperature, the capacity recover. So this is a reverse switch. And the small cell, this is working very well. We want to do the big cell testing and your real, realistic cell phone batteries, and also bigger one. Uh, for, for the car and, and see how this idea will work. So let me come back to the GSEP story. Uh, I want to mention something about GSEP funding's impact. Uh, some of you might know, so, uh, many of you probably don't. Roughly about 2005 to 2008, I joined in faculty 2005, and 2005 and 2008, roughly within this range, there's very little federal funding available. DOEBS just cut their electrochemistry and battery program, no funding. EI still has some. Basically, nobody is funding the battery research. So for about these three years, when I write proposal to outside, it doesn't get funded. We will very badly because nobody believes battery's problem is important. But GSAP recognized very early. So the first GSAP coming in is this number. I still remember I was so happy to receive this, this funding. Otherwise, you know, your tenure case will be toasted uh, completely without funding. So I want to also show you after that what happened. And about 2008 also, there is a big explosion of research recognizing the importance of the battery research for the electric car and then later for the grid. So 2008, uh, I co-founded Amplius. My co-founder is sitting in the audience right there. Up to today, roughly we have 60x of uh, follow-on funding compared to this initial one from GSET. And then there's a huge, uh, uh, you know, huge number of battery program coming into Stanford. Uh, roughly there's uh, about 100x of return 
uh, including uh, the Battery Hub and also the Battery 500 Consortium. And also, this also spin out new idea. How do you make catalyst to do a, a fuel generation? Borrow the idea from batteries to make a new catalyst. Let me mention a few things right here. Number one is, the, is uh, Ampere. So uh, after uh, uh, initial nanowire publication, so it have went through a multiple round of funding. Now there's uh, several million of batteries on the market. So now we learn how to use silicon. Uh, for the high energy battery. So this is happening. Just to share with you a few pictures right, right here. This is Amplius UC plan. This is our board of directors taking pictures roughly about a month, two months ago. And uh, UC China to celebrate this manufacturing plan. Um, I also like to mention Battery 500. This is a new consortium announced several months ago uh, uh, by White House. Uh, battery 500, 500 here means 500 watt hour per kilogram of the batteries for transportation. Uh, DOE really like to double, to triple 500 watt hour per kilo. Also roughly get you, if you have a Tesla for the same size of battery pack, it will go to about 500 to 600 miles if you can get to this 500 watt hour per kilogram of batteries. So after, the, after Jesus' initial investment, now we have a very strong team here at Stanford. Indeed, we are the co-lead with uh, PNNL National Lab to lead this uh, $50 million consumption uh, with uh, 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 four national labs, five universities involved. Uh, we have uh, indeed Tesla, uh, IBM, <laughs> to serve as uh, our advisory board, uh, industry advisory board. So these are some of the key people you see right there. Uh, some familiar face, so Jernan is from uh, here. Uh, uh, you see John Gooding now, you see Stan Whittingham. Stan, a long time ago, used to be a poster with uh, Bob Parkins. Uh, so you see a number of people right here. Um, we identified the key chemistry. How do we produce 500 watt per kilo? Uh, how much time do I have? Probably getting close. So I will skip, I will skip this then. Um, I will come to the last slide, um, the future of the batteries. If you look at high energy for transportation, the, the current uh, graphite, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide, this uh, combination anode and cathode, roughly get to 300 watt per kilo. That should be okay. Silicon combination with MMC can get to 400. And lithium metal and the high nickel MMC get you 500. I think this pathway is highly promising. In the next five years, we could get to somewhere 350 to, 500, uh, to 400. And the 500 range is very promising, lithium metal and sulfur combination. So we have a pathway to get there. But for grid scale, the story might change slightly. Lithium ion battery cells might still play a very important role in the grid scale storage. But these other ideas coming in possible. Aqueous solution batteries, low cost and uh, very safe, and also flow batteries. Um, these are uh, multiple choices uh, for the grid scale. Well, let me end my talk by thanking my whole research group and uh, uh, GCEP support and also DOE support over the years and a number of collaborators uh, working together uh, 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 at Stanford campus right here. The culture is uh, fantastic. The collaboration is just very active. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a great talk and for all the great work you've done over the years. Um, we are getting close to the time to finish, but if there are one or two very quick questions, we'll take them. So I see there's one over here. So if there is a different technology, different chemistry, different physics that can go past the 500 and possibly sooner, um, is that something that you would consider? I will, yes, I will. Uh, however, getting to uh, energy density, you know, the, to get the batteries to work, there's multiple parameters to consider. 
to some other things, maybe one parameter is so outstanding, but the others are so, so bad. So it needs to be a balance. It needs to be a balance. Right. One, one question here, and then I think we have to wrap up. Uh, you didn't mention anything about uh, super caps in relation to this, and especially the new work in graphene uh, mm -hmm. super caps. Maybe you can say a little bit about that sure. and how they compare. So super cap has very high power. Uh, but energy density is very low. Uh, roughly, you consider that super cap is about, uh, you barely get to a 200 watt per kilo, super cap is in the order of uh, 30. So uh, seven times difference. So I think for very high power needs, super cap can play an important role. For the usual needs, if you do transportation, super cap's role is not that big. It's um, because uh, the cost will be very high. You have seven times reduction of energy uh, density. So the cost per kilowatt hour will go very high. Uh, but with that saying, I think uh, there's certain special application. For example, if you do a bus, uh, bus run usually, you know, uh, 50 miles perhaps. Uh, you can do fast charging. And uh, so every time you go to the end, you, f you do fast charging and then come back. It, it might work for, for the case of the bus, uh, but for the regular car, super caps will, will be uh, not that big. Yeah. Even with graphene, it doesn't increase that much. I think graphene is oversold uh, for m many cases. It's, over, it's oversold. Okay, well, I'm afraid we have to stop there, so let's thank uh, Yi one more time. Thanks, Yi, for a yep. great job. Thank, thank you. you.